All right, so we'll go ahead and get the record started. It's having all sorts of issues running the record. I'm going to restop and reshare to make sure the record isn't being fumbled with. Um, it is not displaying very cleanly. All right, so I'm assuming you can still see the screen. It's struggling to figure out how to do all of the things at the same time. So um, one of the add-ons that you've got to include is going to be the image processing toolbox. So that's going to be uh, necessary for several different reasons. Um, so if you have not installed that, which I'm guessing you probably have not yet, uh, that's one that you want to add because this allows for visualization of all different kinds of data. Um, so while you guys are taking a look for that, um, there's a couple things that, that we can continue to work on here. So one of which is you want to be able to see what's happening with the uh, with especially things like that first image when you're looking at this and saying, all right, so um, these need to be uh, displayed. And this is all key information based on how the function works. So what you want to do is you want to look in the, in, at what the help is telling you in the context of what the prompt is saying here. So what we need to do is we need to look at our our row and say you know we we have our coordinates for x y z and t um, where t is time um, or maybe it's a uh, yeah t is typically time so three or four dimensional array of information so there's there's pixel intensity data that's displayed in here and that's what we're trying to, to understand. So uh, the images are pixel grid in X and Y. And then we have a number Z, which ones we want to use. And so we have to look at this and say, okay, um, when I'm pulling in the image SC command, this is what I want to do. So I want to, I want to use image SC and I want to use the way that um, especially it's being used up here, you can have one thing graphed against another. And this is often how things like, things you guys will be familiar with in some degree called heat maps um, are generated. There's also uh, different kinds of surface plots and things of that nature. Um, and you can pair surface plots with much fancier um, heat maps and some other things. So a lot of very interesting kinds of graphs that you can do here that Excel will never be able to even dream of. And this is why this is a real um, full weight um, image processing software in a way that uh, other softwares simply are not. So there are a bunch of others out there, uh, but MATLAB has kind of become, at least in the engineering space, uh, a King Kong uh, of sorts. So uh, we want to display information in terms of which slice we want to be displaying. And that's the first challenge is I want you to see if you can display an image from this. And then we'll take a look at, uh, at what we can find. So um, you're gonna be using the image SC command. So we're using image SC and we need to plot from C. So we have a vector or a matrix, but first, before we even get this far, we need to know something about, for instance, how the image data loads in. So we can even, um, we can even set up breakpoints and do some other things here as well. Um, but we can go back to the live editor and we can say for this one, just run this little section. And if we run this first section, it'll load in images. Dot MAT. 
So the image SC default, um, I think is something like this. So we'll take a look at how to include this. But this is what I want you guys to try and take a stab at first is thinking in terms of how this operates. So image is a grid. Let's take a look at what the what the data looks like. This is much larger than what it can summarize because it's uh, not a simple array, but 1536 by 1536 pixels and 20 total slices. And they're all gradients of uh, of gray, basically of, of contrast or light intensity. So you want to display something from image, and then you want to, uh, so you want to display just Z for one. So I want you guys to give this a try based on their little helps here. I'm going to set up breakout rooms real quick, and then we'll come back in a few minutes and see if you guys have been successful. All right, so those should be open now. All right, you guys have any ideas at the moment? I'm trying to install the image processing thing right now. Okay, that'll take a little bit of time to get that included, but that'll be an important part to make some of the canny edge detection and stuff work later in the program. When I tried to install that, it said it, uh, my restriction, I had a restriction or something that I needed uh, permission from the professor or something? Um, you shouldn't, um, so long as it's the actual image processing toolbox. Um, that's a thing that if that continues to be the case, you may have to jump on with IT because uh, they may have a setting that, that <laughs> they have to reconfigure um, because it, it shouldn't be preventing you from installing it, but that's what creates that issue because they've got some funny business on the back end where they set MATLAB permissions and things and they almost always have it set wrong. Okay. All right. Anyone have an idea to call a specific image out of a set or a stack? Think about how we call information out of an array of information. Give you guys another minute or two, then we'll come back to the main room. 
All right. How are you guys doing? Any ideas how to pull information out of an array? Um, well, I'm having a little bit of trouble because of, uh, I don't think my file's importing correctly. So I'm trying to re uh, download that one library or something that you. Uh, yeah, the, the, so you should be able to load the image processing toolbox and that will, that will enable you to do some of the features at the very, very end of what we're talking about today. Okay. Yeah, so my, uh, my image file must have not have downloaded correctly. So I tried to re-download it and it's just not allowing me to get like a, a dot or MAT file. Yeah, so the, I added the image processing dot zip and that should include all of everything that you need. Um, the other two files you can ignore on there, but the image processing dot zip is the one that contains the live script, which is actually the thing that you need here. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. When I tried to load, um, like how you did that image, it just didn't come up with anything. It's giving me errors. Yeah, Thanks. it's the the image processing toolbox is going to be needed, I think, to even run image SC. So okay. that's also going to be that's also why we're going over this is there's a lot of issues there. All right, let me check on the last room real quick, then we'll come back to the main room. We're so close though, like we have like a few more weeks and then we'll be chilling. Yeah. You guys alive? And uh <laughs> Sort of, kind of. Yeah. You guys have any idea how to call the data out of the image stack? Um, I think so, but I haven't tried it because my uh, my MATLAB is still downloading. So. Yeah. yeah, and on the on the campus access point, you're probably going to be rocking like six meg per year, or something. So. <laughs> It's, uh, it's fan. This is why Zoom works so well. Um, yeah, so I think even for the image SC command, what you're going to need is the image processing toolbox to be loaded up because reasons. So that's one of the packages that takes a while and adds like another half hour or something easily to the install. So we didn't have you do that up front just because uh, you would be literally installing MATLAB the entire first MATLAB day of class. So yeah, that's fun. All right. Well, it sounds like everyone else is in the same boat. I'm going to bring everybody back to the main room and we'll talk a little bit about the next steps here. All right. Bring everybody back. So we'll have another couple minutes here. Still waiting on a few. All right, we still got a couple more we're waiting on. Almost there. All right. So we should have everyone back now. All right, so um, I think even to really properly use image SC, um, I don't remember this being in that image processing toolbox explicitly, but uh, it will make your life easier once if you've got the image processing toolbox installed um, when you go to start working with some of this. So um, there's a couple different methods that you can use um, because of the 
uh, language. You can also do loading if you're only, especially if you're only loading a single uh, file, you can load images just like this. And the dot MAT is assumed. And you can run this first section. And now we've got a new uh, image plotted because we have loaded image. But if I comment this out and still run this first section, you should see what it looks like here. If I run this first section and I load up images. All right, so this is all fresh and ready to go. This one, whenever we're pulling data out of some kind of an array, just like what it's talking about up here, if Z is equal to one, because we only want to see the first image located where Z equals one, this is a fairly important aspect, where Z is equal to one, that means all X and all Y, so all X, all Y, and then the first image, this is the C, the array, and then we haven't done any options, but if you wanted to add options, um, you can take a look, especially in the help, and see what do we want to change? Um, what kinds of images do we want to see? So when we run this section, now we can see that we get an image plotted back. And we could change this to be slice five or any of the other ones. Uh, that's not the one specifically that we're looking for. But what that's going to do is somewhere between zero and 20, we want to tell it where we're actually wanting it to plot. So if now we run this section, it'll be a different slice, just slightly. And we can do 10. So we're not updating the image correctly here. It should be updating the image correctly. Um, all right. So this I'm going to delete because I don't need. So um, the first image is just here. All right. Then the next part that we need to think about is when we're working on these kinds of data sets, uh, especially a lot of the medical images tend to be monochrome. A lot of that is so that we're not storing additional levels of data uh, with color maps and other things. We're doing monochromatic to try and compress the data size a little bit because they want high resolution, but also fast loading, which means we need to strip some amount of information out of those data sets to be able to accomplish that, to make them smaller sizes. So um, you can change color maps. And one of the things that we can do is we can use the color map command. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to see if you can figure out uh, what you would do to get a color map of gray to display. So that's your next task. So I'll go ahead and open up breakout rooms and let you guys take a look at that for a couple minutes. All right, any ideas for the color map command?
No ideas? I'll give you guys a second to Google. All right, any ideas here for using the color map command? Uh, I'm currently downloading the, uh, the library. Finally got it to work. Okay. Yeah, I think I got it to work. Okay. So we're making some progress at least. That's a good start. Is it pretty much just color map and then gray? Uh, I would say that's a good guess. Yeah, that's all that I've heard. Okay. I'm going to check in in the other room and see. All right. Any ideas how to make it work? Um, I think just finished. So like I'm barely opening it up. So I, I don't I don't know yet. Okay. You, have you got the image processing toolbox downloading still? Yeah. No, uh, it just finished. So. Okay. So yeah, you'll be able to start sort of following along and it'll make a little more sense. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. I'll give you guys another couple seconds to work on it here. And then we'll go back to the main room. A couple of you got there. A couple of you are still trying to get downloads to finalize. Still got a couple that are hanging on in the breakout rooms. So yeah, once you've got the once you've got the toolbox downloaded and installed, that'll make life a whole lot easier. All right, there we go. I think we got everybody back now. Um, so yes, a couple of you got it very quickly. Um, this one's actually fairly straightforward. So color map set to gray. Um, and that's one of the first uh, tricks. So now we have back the image that we saw at the very, very beginning. So then we're looking for this first part. We also want to now make some modifications to the axes. Um, the color map we can also change to be a different set. So how would we change the <clears throat> how would we change it to the hot color map? Need to know which map options there are. Right. So you can change which one it's using. You can do the flag if you really hate your eyes. Prism, same sort of deal. Uh, cool is not always very useful. Uh, depends on what you're trying to do. Um, hot is often used, especially for heat maps. Um, of course, turbo is the best because reasons. So you can change to different color maps using color map command and then changing what one you're going to be using. So we can try the hot color map and that will change this. You can also try turbo because everything is better in turbo. There we go. All right. So lots of different options for how you can set these up. So then, okay, we need to actually scale the image dimensions. So this is another command that you guys 
have seen briefly, I think once, uh, but when we're doing this, um, we're gonna do some manipulation to the axes. Uh, and there's a specific command that you want to use and there's a specific command that we want to not use. So uh, what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to dig around a little bit in the help for this next step. And there's a command called axes. And that does one thing. And then there's a command called axis. And that does another thing. And so I want you guys to take a look and see how we modify these axes because you normally don't see medical images with these uh, numbers set up on the edges of the image. So that's your next challenge is how do we set the axes? All right, any ideas which command we need to use? It's going to be between those two. Give you guys a couple more minutes to look around. All right, any ideas which command you want to use? Uh, yeah, axis or axis image, right? So axis, and then uh, because you've already got the same, technically because you've already got the same image object selected, um, mm -hmm. you don't have to redefine which image because um, it's still going to be active on that same uh, first image. But okay. yes, you will find the axis command is the one that you want to be using. Um, axes does other stuff. Um, really quick before yeah. you leave, uh, still not loading in any of like the pictures for me. It says unable to resolve the name images.mat. Um, let's see. Let me. We've got almost everyone back now. Okay. So a couple of you are encountering uh, or will encounter shortly this particular issue. Uh, this is something that's going to come up over and over and over and over and over and over again using MATLAB. Um, I stress all the time to you guys about the, the, the path and the directory. Those are two interchangeable terms. Um, one of the key things, again, to understand is that 
whenever these folders are present, even if you have them under your location, wherever MATLAB is under your documents, even though the folder is there, it doesn't mean, so right now this is grayed out. So if I run this, what it'll do, if I try and just run this code, it'll go in and say, mm, nope, can't load it, doesn't exist. And a couple of you will be thoroughly confused because you haven't remembered all the things I've tried to hammer into your heads about the path and the directory. So navigating the directories are real simple, going up and down a level and things like that, um, opening things. Uh, under MATLAB, you have to include by right-clicking, adding to path selected in folders and subfolders. So if you have a class example, so some of the things I'm developing for one of the new freshman courses, I have to include folders and subfolders every time I go to open this program. So every time you reopen MATLAB, you have to go back and re-include these. Otherwise, even though that file was right here the whole time, until that's added to the active directory, the active path is what it's called in MATLAB. Um, it's called directories, other, other places, it's all the same stuff. Um, you have to include those and the subfolders in order to get access to it so that it can actually load up the images. So now it's got the information back. So uh, how did we get rid of all the numbers? Couple of you figured out that command. What was it? The trick was to just turn the axis off. You want to use axis because what it'll tell you is it has multiple options. You can select style, visibility. In this case, visibility is the one that we want. So we want to turn it off. So we can turn visibility on or off. It even gives you choices on what the syntax is in a live script. So live scripts are literally like cheating in MATLAB. Back in my day, things were hard and we had to go back and look things up in the help. And the help used examples that only a mathematician would comprehend. And so as a freshman, we were trying to figure out what in the heck the Blasius case for a tensor was. So uh, you guys have it much easier than that. All right, so uh, another thing that it's gonna do is it's gonna go through and it's going to do uh, edge detection. And this is another reason why you're gonna need uh, some of the image processing tools included, because um, I think this one is another one, um, the edge detection. There's a couple different versions of the edge detection that we're going to do in this code, um, including the one down here that's the canny edge detector. Um, so this one, if you were to do some reading, um, it's like unlisted anymore in the edge methodology. Um, it's it's something that. Um, you can still make reference to. Uh, it just is not easy to find in the documentation. So this one is a little bit more strange, but you want to look at what this does for this first part. So that's the first section taken care of. And now we have the second section. We still have our little uh, warning because this isn't complete yet because we need to do some other things. So this is why as you're going through this homework, uh, you want to probably run the sections individually and see if those are working correctly rather than trying to run the entire thing each and every time um, in the same way that you would just stepping through uh, with breakpoints. So um, this first part, what it's trying to do, let's take a look at what this one does. Let's just run section. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to take right here, it's trying to develop an image using this information, using the first example, using edge detection. And it's a logarithmic with a threshold of 0 0.0025 uh, and a sigma of 20. So this is uh, looking at a 
a Gaussian algorithm. So looking at an, an average distribution, you're trying to get a hold of the edges of things on the image. So you can increase that or decrease that. So if we decrease the uh, if we decrease the sigma, we will change what information we pick up. As we lower that sigma, this is why this code was already picked for you. As we lower that sigma, we pick up more and more and more and more of the image. So we pick up more and more and more of the grayscale. But if we set it too much higher, then we don't really get much of anything. So there's a balancing act. And this is where there's a bit of an art form to this. So whereas if this is changed um, our threshold, we change our threshold, that significantly impacts what we pick up. So this one gives us uh, some more edges of some other features, but this is the settings that we've been told that we need to run for the first edges. So, okay, we've got some edges, and that's good. Uh, you can also, when you're working with these images, you can do uh, zooming and all kinds of interesting things with them. Anyway, um, so this is doing a few things um, and you can specify when you're using the axis command, you can specify uh, that it's for that specific image and then you can turn them off or um, you can just use axis off for the plot that you have, you're actively working on. So. Um, the image SC also doesn't strictly require that you use things like the hold on command. Um, they work differently than some of the other plot types. So that's another thing that you want to keep in mind. So um, the, the same thing we want to try uh, with the canny edge detector. So this one, if you do some looking around, this is what you'll find. So the canny method is there and it's a little different. So if you were to take something like they give an example, here's some images of some coins, and then they want you to uh, use canny edge detection. And then they do some other filtering. So here's the Sobel filter, here's the canny filter. There's a reason that canny is used. So I want you to see if you can use the canny filtering or canny edge detection to set this up for the next part. So you still wanna display the image after the edge detection. So you have the prototype up above, you just need to change what type of edge detection you're doing. So that's gonna be your next challenge. So I'll go ahead and open these up again.
any ideas on how that could work? Um, kind of. I'm still kind of uh, reading the the help. So. Okay. Well, that's part of the reason why I'm going to continue pointing you guys back and back and back again, because you can do a lot with the help in the context of what we're working on here. But a lot of this is uh, so new and so high level that you're you are using functions in MATLAB, um, but this is this is a much higher level of function use than anything you guys have programmed previously. So take a look at what you can find as far as what that syntax might look like. And that should help you guys, especially since you have the prototype for how to make it work up above. And then you can run it for all 20 images. I'll give you guys a few minutes to take a look at that. All right, how are you guys doing? Any ideas on how this might work? I think I'm on the right track. Okay. You have the prototype up above, so you should be able to keep most of it. So the help file will be very useful in trying to get some idea how to change the syntax. And right, I'm gonna check on the last group. Okay, any ideas how to make that work? Close, you're getting there. Got a pretty good idea there. So we've already got the prototype for the starting point up above. Any other ideas? I'm still just trying to figure it out. I'm, I was having a little bit of trouble at first, but I'm working on it. Okay. It's a reasonably straightforward command. Um, and when you see it, it's it will yeah, it will be an oh, okay, I see what you did there. All right, I'll give you guys a couple more minutes and we'll come back to the main room.
still waiting on a few. So the real question becomes, did anyone figure out how to get it to do canny edge detection? Okay, I think we got everybody back now. A couple people are thinking they've got it. So this one was one of the hardest tasks you've had so far. So let's take a look and see how close you guys were. So there we are, we've got a couple important features there. So canny edge detection is primarily switching the method from logarithmic to canny. And we had the prototype up here already. But what we can do is we can see using the canny edge detection and by tweaking our parameters just a little bit, we can get a pretty good result out of the canny edge detector. So if we open this up in a separate figure window, it'll look like this. We can resize this to make it easier for those on a very, very, very small screen to be able to see. And you can zoom in on parts and actually see where it's doing edge detection. So somewhere around here is really about as far as you actually want to be able to go. So we can see edges and outlines of features, which is important. So somewhere around this would be pretty good. So once we've got that figured out, then we need to do it across an entire array. So that's one of the next things that you guys need to figure out how you can actually run is how do we do that over and over and over again for all 20 images? So that's our next challenge to try and get to the next step. So I want you guys to take a few minutes and see if you can actually take this process and rinse and repeat without having to hard code it in. You should have a lot of tools you already know for doing that kind of work. All right, any ideas how we can do that? Do you change like the one to a 20? So right place to be looking, but we don't just want to change it to 20 because we want to run the edge detection on all 20 individual images. So then would you do like one, one, 20? So you would do uh, something like instead of, instead of trying to run it as a series of numbers, mm -hmm. what you might want to think about using is a tool from the ancient past 
uh, something like a for loop. Okay. And that will make your life a little bit easier because you can get there the way that you're describing, but you're going to end up creating a lot of extra work to make that particular path work. Okay. So I might look at how to implement a for loop to do that. Okay. Other ideas? Nobody suggested hire an intern. Man, you guys got to think bigger. All right. How are you guys doing? Any ideas on how to do this? Didn't you say a colon was like include all? So a yes, um, a colon is include all. But if you were to try and do a colon and then uh, in place of the one, you're going to find that it's going to struggle with that because it needs to run the edge detection on one image at a time. So you need to think about okay. tools you already know to do something over and over and over again, um, and then store those results. Okay. So any ideas? How would we do that? Um, a for loop? Yep, for loop is what I'd be looking at. I mean, your, your alternate really comes down to be uh, you hire an intern. Like that's, that's really your other option. There's no like choice three. So that's what I would look at next. All right, I'm gonna check on one of the other groups real quick. All right, how are you guys doing? Any ideas how to make this work? Um, I'm still trying to like figure out how the other one came, <laughs> the, the other one, cause I got like the first part, like the BW and then edge image and canny, but I don't know where the, the 0 0.25 or 0 0.025 and the 10 came from. I'm just so the 0 0.0025 um, is the same. Um, it's the same edge detection that we did in the block just above it. Mm -hmm. um, but the 10 is adjusted to give us uh, to drop what's called the sigma to drop the, the standard deviation range for the Gaussian algorithm so that what it's doing is it's picking up more of the edges without going too far and picking up a lot of the noise in the image. So that was a parameter that I adjusted slightly to get a pretty clear image for you guys to see. Mm -hmm. And 10 is what I would recommend using in order to get really crystal clear results further mm -hmm. down. So do we know what tools we can use to go and do something over and over and over again? The loop, like, right? Yeah, we would use something like a for loop uh, mm -hmm. in order to do the processing. So there's a couple things that we can do there uh, and we'll talk about it. I mean, your other option is to hire an intern who will hopefully be smart enough to use a for loop, right? All right, so I'll give you guys a little chance to try and see what you can do with it.
We'll have everybody back in a few more seconds here. All right, we got just about everybody back. So a couple of you had the right idea. Go back to sharing this. A couple of you had the right idea. So you wanna implement a for loop. And in order to do that successfully, you need to take the core operation, which is this one. So this edge detection, we need to convert that to a for loop, which means this has to be reconfigured from an N to, uh, or from a one to some index variable like an N or an I or something else. Uh, this 10, we just changed from our value of 20 up above, because this gives us a little lower threshold and a lot more, uh, a lot more edges to work with in terms of stuff that we'll put together as the final stitching together of all of these 3D surfaces. So we have to think about this in this sort of piecewise fashion, and that will really help quite a bit. Um, so this is what it might look like. Um, and you wanna create an array. So some edge image and that array is gonna be zeros. These are just placeholders. And we're gonna use the size command. So if we forget what that's about, we can always go back and look, help on size. The size tell us, strangely it tells us the dimensions of things. So we want the same size as image. So our original data set up here of our image. So then we have image and then we create from this our edge image step-by-step step, saying all X, all Y and one individual slice is the same data, all X, all Y and that same individual slice each time through our loop using the canny edge detection with these parameters. So what this will do is this will give us an array called edge image when we run this section. And we'll get our edge image show up here. So it should be storing to the workspace. Looks like it's not yet. There we go. So edge image is the same size and has all 20 of our slices with edge detection now, which is great. So then, because of the way that often happens, we sometimes, uh, in, term, in terms of how to actually do the processing, uh, we want to cut down the total amount of, of pixels that we're using. Uh, so we want to crop down and make it 400 by 1200 uh, for the X and Y respectively, but we don't want to crop in the Z direction. So how do we actually crop this and make it work? Well, that's where you want to go back again to your best friend, say, now we know about canny edge detection. We can do... crop data function. So there's a lot of things that we can do where we can trim something down to a specific size and we can tell it some information. So I want you guys to see what you can do to trim down some of the information so that we're, we're resizing all of that. And one of the tricks that you want to pay attention to is down below, there's some more code 
that makes a figure out of this. So this one is already done. Um, and this is a really important aspect of how to get an image displayed. This ISO surface is one that's really, really important. I've renamed this to make sense with this naming convention. So instead of RSZ E image, it's RSZ edge image. And so what that's gonna do, you gotta make sure both of these match because you do ISO surface and ISO normals in a pair because long complicated story. The ISO surface allows us to take information and then stitch together 3D surfaces from that data set. And we can use patches to fill in some of the missing information sometimes and things. So um, there's a lot of useful bits and pieces of how ISO surfacing works, but that part of the code, because it's particularly tricky and complex is much more uh, difficult to deal with. Um, so this in the, in the workspace, um, there's a question about the, the value for N. Uh, once this has run through, the last state will be n equal 20 and then it will end so n is just a value that gets reassigned each time through the loop so n is not stored as an array it's used as an index variable so it's just a singular value that ranges from 1 to 20 um, and when we do this it assumes integer steps from 1 to 20. if we wanted to specify we could go uh, one by one 220, but that's redundant um, and not strictly necessary. So that's why n is listed as 20 uh, up at the top. So um, that's the, that's the, um, yes, it might, if you're, if you're in the process of operating it and your workspace says n equal one, um, you might be sitting there for a few minutes while it turns through all of this. Because um, this kind of level of image processing um, will uh, bring some computers to their knees. Uh, that's just a thing that happens. So um, we want to think while we're working on this part um, in terms of using this variable, because this variable, the one that we use just up above, um, or the variable is the same as what we want to use up above. So we want to do something here with this variable name and actually crop that data down. So I want to see if you guys can uh, give that a shot and see what you can determine. All right, any ideas? For me, you keep saying it doesn't recognize the function crop data. It it might have an issue. There's a simpler way that I'm gonna show you how to do it. Okay. So this one will make sense. And once you see it, you'll go, oh yeah, of course that's what you do. But again, that's what a lot of this last part of the class is going to be, so. Um, we'll jump back in just a couple minutes here. I want to check on one more group. All right, any ideas? I'm going to show a little simpler way to do it. Yeah, I think I kind of have an idea, but um, I'm reading the, like I, I had an idea and then I started reading the thing and now I'm kind of confused. 
Mm. Yes, that is the sort of nominal state for this class. So um, this is why the assignments get exponentially harder at this point in time. So I'll bring everybody back and show what I'm talking about. Professor? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're still waiting on a couple, but this is the final tip for today. So what you can do with the images, because it's just an array of information, you don't even have to use another function exactly. What you can actually do is you can actually resize images simply by selectively storing information out of those. So you selectively store from 400 to 1200 and 400 to 1200 and then all of Z and this picks that range, that sort of middle zone of the image and stores it to the resized edge image that you then run the patch and the ISO surfacing on. So you don't even really have to use a crop function. You can kind of cheat by simply selectively storing information. And this works for all sorts of data types and data sets where you want to only select a certain region, you can store it just using the same exact method. So that part's a little uh, deceptively difficult, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so that's what we're actually doing. And then we run through and do this. So if we rerun this section, what we end up with, and it takes a second or two to actually churn through, um, again, creating those, uh, creating all of the edges. So we'll get a new figure that'll show up once it's done processing. And it will show us um, in red because of our color choices here. Our face color is red and no edge color. This will give us, based on the patch that we're running, uh, this will give us a stitched together surface in 3D of what our scan slices are in 2D. So this is how we can come back and view them in 3D with a one to one to one aspect ratio um, using uh, tight axes with visibility turned off. So, um, and it also shows uh, lighting all sort of around the object. So this will give a 3D plot. This particular part might actually even crash some of your computers. So uh, that'll be super fun, but I'm hoping it'll give you a final rendered image here in just a second or two so that you can see that this does actually work correctly and then stores that image back out of everything. Um, the way this is set up right now and configured, this doesn't really take advantage of parallelized computation. You can see we've got our, our plot that it ran here, and here we go. This is our figure. So we can open this up in a figure window and actually see all this stuff stitched together in surfaces. So an uh, internal slice of a person, looks like part of a uh, this based on size and location. Um, this might actually be a, a small section slice of part of their spinal cord. But there you go. Um, you've now seen that the, uh, the ISO surfacing will actually generate a 3D image. Um, and I wanted you guys to actually get up to this point 
and understand how this is working rather than just having a bunch of zeros in the homework. So any final questions on this? And based on our, based on our progress, um, we will still have class on Thursday, uh, but what we'll do is run that as a Q&A session. So if there's no further questions, then we will end there today.